Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of Real History. I'm your host, Jared Frederick, and I am joined by... Emily Doherty. Hi, good to see everybody again. My good friend and fellow historian who has had extensive work in the museum world and also previously worked at Colonial Williamsburg, where much of John Adams was filmed. So we left off last time discussing the film's interpretation of the Declaration of Independence, and now we are setting out on the high seas for France as Ambassador John Adams heads off to the various courts of King Louis, and uh, we will see what adventures and misadventures await him there. So let's go ahead and dive right in to part three of John Adams' Don't Tread on Me. Bushels of meal when the corn is ground. You are like to outshine all farmers. Here's what I love about this series, is that they're so good at setting the mood. It's, I think we discussed in the first couple episodes, shot in the South, but you never know that. And I say that as somebody from Maine, <laughs> um, is that they do a really good job of putting it in time and place and creating a feeling. But you are here now. And you are safe. She's still wearing the flimsy hood that you don't like. She is still wearing Aww. that cloak. Bless her heart. It's probably filmed on the same day. I was going to say. Like we have one day with the fake snow people. It takes quite a lot to put that down. Where is the Congress to meet? In York to the west of the city. So he mentions that the capital is now in York in York, Pennsylvania, and a lot of people may not realize that for a very short time, York, Pennsylvania was the capital of the United States, and the reason being is that the British had taken over the city. Philadelphia, yes. There's some great first-person accounts of Occupation Philadelphia, um, people who keep diaries, um, mm -hmm. great letters. Uh, but yeah, what do you do when all of a sudden the capital of your country is overtaken? Mm -hmm. And I think it, it speaks to the gray area that so many people found themselves in during the war because you had to choose which side you were going to be on. In a place like Philadelphia, it's like a slinky going back yeah. and forth. Are you to add more years to those we have already spent upon? This is such a universal sentiment for anybody, I think, who has had to go through a separation because of a job or because of um, uh, a duty, a responsibility. Um, they do a good job of hitting on those moments of like, yes, we've never sailed an 18th century ship to France, but we can understand how much it stinks to say goodbye to somebody we love. There is a cost to love, John. We think of Abigail Adams as this remarkable woman out of time for her time, that she does take care of things while he's gone and that she continues in the business of running the farm and all of that. But she's actually a little bit more um, ordinary to the time than people believe and understand. Uh, it's not unusual that somebody even before the war would have sailed to England to take care of business mm. for months at a time. And then you become as the wife the de facto leader of that household. Mm -hmm. So it is something she was raised to do. Uh, in that, she's not stepping too far out of sentiment of the 18th century, but she then takes it a little further and then demands some equitable rights out of the situation. Are you leaving now? We are. She hasn't aged in seven years. I it's was incredible. going to say, I go because I love you. Why does Johnny get to go and not us? One day, perhaps. And Charles would indeed get to go mm -hmm. later on because something that you don't get a sense of in the film in the name of the, the compression of events uh, is that he made multiple trips yes. across the Atlantic going to France and other countries in Europe. Um, this episode makes it seem like it's one continuous, long off, extended venture, um, which is not necessarily the case. Remember, you are accountable to your maker for all your words and actions. What is she tying on his head? I, I have so many questions right now. 
Now, I know in the South there is evidence of women tying white handkerchiefs around their ears because somebody from not Virginia wrote that they all looked like they had toothaches in the winter. Mm. Which I can verify that if you're wearing a cap, it doesn't cover your ears most mm -hmm. of the time. So you need some, but a Very burlap true. sack, I mean, they don't, they're not destitute. <laughs> Give them some wool. Godspeed. Godspeed. Some may be wondering why even bother take your young son on this journey, but as one of the previous conversations, hinted at, you know, they thought that this would be a very important component of his maturation process. Mm -hmm. uh, that if you want this young up and coming country to be a country of the world and to be on a global standing, well, your young people need to be attuned to some of the things that happen in the world and you can't be narrow minded as Abigail said. Yes, and I think also I mean, before the war, it was a practice for people who had means to send their sons, mostly, to Europe to get a better education. If you think about the state of the educational system, even the few colleges that were established here in the United States were so young. And if you could go to a college that's hundreds of years old or one that you know was founded in your backyard a couple of years ago, um, Harvard, then maybe you choose to go overseas. <laughs> This is an 18th century experience I do not need to have. The idea of being trapped on a ship, to me, just makes me claustrophobic to begin with. <laughs> and I was, uh, I was on the sailing team in high school, and I will tell you, this is not an experience I need. So there were some corpses on the deck of the ship here. And I read that there was actually a person or two killed by lightning and other things during the storm that we just saw. Oh. And so there were some fatalities that were not battle related that were caused by the natural elements on the ship. And so perhaps these corpses on the deck are a tip of the hat to that. That's a history nerd Easter egg very right there. Very much so, <laughs> very, very much so. Chief Gunner! So one thing I like to talk to little um, children about right now is the um, danger inherent with artillery pieces of the 18th century. Mm -hmm. You have to trust that everybody around you is doing their job and doing it well because, um, you know, there's there's lots of different jobs that have to come together to fire one cannonball. Mm -hmm. um, and then put that danger on a floating piece of wood in the middle of the ocean. And it's not necessarily just the enemy that can be um, fatal in this situation. Mm -hmm. And they're sailing in winter. I believe they mm -hmm. set sail in February. And it was a frigate that was appropriately called the Boston. <laughs> uh, and the captain who Adams just had kind of a nasty scuffle with was a guy by the name of Samuel Tucker. Um, and as we see here, he was ordered to go below decks. But in one form or another, I think it's open to interpretation. Yeah, to what extent does John Adams actually play a role in this yeah. naval engagement? Uh, he probably doesn't fire the first shot, probably not firing a musket <laughs> at the ship. I, uh, what good is that going to do? Not very much. Not very much <laughs> at all. good effect. But I could definitely see him, like, you know, carrying powder and ball and hoisting it up the, the steps or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, so he participated in some capacity. We just don't know how much. I really don't know why they're even bothering to shoot muskets or rifles at this point. Because it looks good on screen. It looks good on screen, but I, I mean, yeah. <laughs> on my I think I watched this for the first time around the same time I watched Master and Commander, and maybe that's why I have such an adverse reaction to going out on a ship in the mm. middle of an ocean. It's, yeah, it's worth pointing out that yeah, the, the films are only three years apart or yes. so. Uh, and there's definitely a flair of Master and Commander in these scenes between the 
the deck view and then the, the surgeon here working below decks. Can I get as much of this as you can? Do the game! Now! We have to get as much as you can. <laughs> Now, to my understanding, this man was not actually wounded in the battle. This is another example of the film condensing things. What actually occurred, for at least according to one account, is that they were firing an honorary volley mm. for a French ship that was passing them. And as they were doing that, something happened with one of the artillery pieces and incapacitated him as such. Adams did assist with that surgery, but this happened sometime after their encounter with the British vessel, and that sailor died about a week later. Yes, of his it wounds. wasn't so, immediate. And so there's like three different timelines here that are mushed into one in this scene. Uh, speaking of accidental deaths caused by salatory volleys. Uh, this is here's so a, much fun talking about these things. <laughs> here's a, here's a uh, side rabbit hole. Robert Morris, who financed the Revolutionary War in good part through speculation to his friends, came into his fortune fairly early because his father died as the result of an injury sustained when um, he was rowing out to meet a ship and the captain was getting ready to fire a volley to signify that they were approaching. Um, he was too far close to the ship and the captain had a fly land on his nose. He swatted the fly, they took that as the signal to fire the volley and it killed Robert Morris Sr. I believe. Which could have changed the, you know, that's one of those things that that fly could have changed the course of the revolution yeah. because had he not had that money, who knows if we wouldn't have had, would have had any of these. Gotta watch out for those celebratory artillery salvos. <laughs> that's yes. the big takeaway <laughs> from this episode. I did not think I would miss strong Quincy. So I presume now we are in the spring of 1778 a lot of things have happened chronologically since our opening scenes. Uh, I presume Saratoga has happened. Yes. And at this very moment, when Abigail is out here working the fields, a few hundred miles to the south of the Valley Forge encampment yes. would have been ongoing at the same time. And there is discontent being stirred currently about Washington's leadership. Um, and lots of people who don't trust that he's doing a good job, especially comparing Washington and the Southern Army with what's happened at Saratoga. Um, there is a, I don't want to call it a plot, uh, a, um, a group of men who get together and start writing letters. Uh, Benjamin Rush is one about how much they believe Washington should no longer be in charge. Um, one actually sends a letter to Patrick Henry and, mm -hmm. and essentially says, I know you'll be our ally in this. We won't tell you who's writing, but you should know who it is based on the handwriting. Mm -hmm. Patrick Henry has no idea who's written this, um, so he sends the letter straight to Washington, and that puts the end to that. <laughs> is this part of the Conway Cabal? It is. Okay. So much drama. I have lots of machinations yes. and political plots. This is rather strange. Uh... Hello? Hello, Dr. Franklin? I do love the playing with scale and the way this is shot is that um, even if those spaces they're shooting in are similar, they have made this space with camera angles look so much bigger. Um, so you can feel the difference between old world and new world. Mm, good catch. My brother who's a filmmaker is a big fan of Dutch angles and there are many Dutch angles as it were. Uh, uh, I trust your crossing was uneventful. Uh, this is my secretary, Mr. Bancroft, Mr. Adams. So uh, Edward Bancroft, the guy who's lingering here in the background, uh, is, he's a double agent of sorts uh, because he is working for Franklin, but he is also an informant mm -hmm. for the British. He sends copies of Franklin's correspondence onto London. Paris is full of spies during this time. And uh, he's just a real double dipper uh, because uh, being paid good money by 
the Americans, the British are matching what the Americans are paying him. And Franklin had the suspicion that he was in the midst of spies and he was always very mindful to never divulge anything too important in his correspondence for that reason. Uh, but it wasn't found until decades later that Bancroft was, was spying on him, not until after both of them had, had passed away. So, uh, treacherous Make- sneak. <laughs> Makes you wonder who we never heard about. Mm-hmm. Because a very good spy, you'll, you'll never know. Uh, no doubt uh, you, you require a, a bath, Mr. Adams. The French set great store by hygiene when it comes to other nations. The dry humor is just not, it, it's unbeatable. It's so good. Keep your chin up. Mm. Comme ça. Good. Mr. Adams, yes. Maitre D is inside. He will show you to your rooms. Some may think it over the top that Franklin is being sculpted, but he wrote home to his family that his image was on every conceivable sort of artwork and souvenir conceivable uh, because they really saw him as one of the great scientific minds of the 18th century. Uh, They loved his sort of homespun humor and sense of American style and as we'll see here in this scene right now, you know, entering the room wearing his coonskin cap he very much plays the role of an American rustic, and the French just eat this up. Uh, and so he was a super celebrity uh, when he arrived in France. And unfortunately for John Adams, that means that he will always be playing second fiddle, which John Adams never likes to be. Oh, you appear to have been tailored by a taxidermist, Doctor. Now the French are determined to see all Americans as rustic, so I, I dress the part. I love the juxtaposition between the, um, the fur hat, which is, you know, emblematic, but really playing a role that Franklin's wearing, and the powder bellows that Adams was having blowing powder onto his wig. And the, the difference between the two, I feel like Franklin's, like you said, playing that rustic, and Adams is trying to be French and you're never going to be able to be something that other people are. You are a very good man, John Adams, a very moral man, but you are not a man for Paris. So just to be clear from a production standpoint, these scenes were not shot in Colonial Williamsburg. No, they were not. Or Virginia. No. I believe they went to Austria and Hungary Hungary. for several of these uh, shots with the, the chateaus and the manors and the like. Hungary stands in for... America a lot actually. They're really great tax cuts if you're a filmmaker. You can shoot in Hungary. Um, the the show Jamestown that came out several years ago was shot in Hungary. Mm. Um, they actually flew some Pamunkey Native American folks over to Hungary to be a part of it. Fascinating. May I present my my colleague, uh, uh, Mr. Adams? Madame Elvicius, La Comtesse, Lignum. Oh, that embroidered waistcoat that's peeking over the, his left shoulder is just everything. <laughs> and I love that you see a couple beauty marks. There's lots of satirical fashion plates about beauty marks in the 18th century. They're not just those round. They would have done um, butterflies like you see on the um, lady there, all sorts of different um, shapes. And just like any new fad or fashion, it gets made fun of by people who are a little too old to wear it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so perhaps explain to us what is the appeal of all of the makeup it, it just like any century people wanted to uh, enhance certain fig- features and detract away from other features so um, there's a great story of a young woman in America who gets her hands on a um, what they called gentlemen's magazines but were essentially literature magazines and it has um, information about how the women in France France are shaving their eyebrows so she decides she's going to shave her eyebrows and she gets in a great deal of trouble for (laughs) that Um, her father was um, Robert Carter III so a very prominent family so even in big families um, there's that clash between what's fashionable and what is appropriate there's great primary source documents out there. If you want to try to create your own makeup, you certainly can use their recipes. 
I recommend not using lead, which is an ingredient <laughs> in a lot of them. Yes. Uh, Chevalier uh, de la Luzerne is to be uh, France's first ambassador in the United States. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, but in some ways, kind of the beauty standards are reversed in comparison to what we have today. Yes. Today, people d have desire to have a nice tan, to look like yes. they've been outdoors. But if you had a tan in the 18th century, that means that you were outside working. Um, yes. And there was more desires to be pale, I understand. I find that beauty and fashion always follows the way you can demonstrate you have leisure time. So now if you can go sit on a beach, it shows people that you've got the leisure time to do that. Mm -hmm. But in the 18th century, if you can stay away from the sun, it shows that you have the means and probably the enslaved people to do the work that you're not doing. So whatever shows that you have time is going to be what is in fashion. And then there's me where I burn and then turn immediately oh, white again. Yes, I burn, sometimes peel, straight pale again. A uh, striking distance of each other. I suppose that they would simply fly together, no? I do think that the, the um, French court was much heightened. It was the height of fashion. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think that this series doesn't really reflect, especially at the beginning of the war, that there are fashionable people in the colonies. You know, it's not the French court, but there are people wearing makeup in the American colonies and dressing nicely. Um, of course, the war changes that a little bit. In freedom we are born, and in freedom we we'll live. Our first is our way. The inherent contradictions that become apparent over time is that these people who are part of a monarchy are celebrating this young republic in the making. Some of them were just absolutely swept up with the idea of a revolution and we need to look no further than you know the young 19 year old Marquis de Lafayette mm -hmm. who's heading to America around this same time. Uh, so was it inevitable that they themselves were going to have a revolution? That's the big question. The Yes, the, the cycle of revolution is interesting because it almost goes another rotation and the French Revolution is sent, sends ripples back through America in some of the back country with people who after the American Revolution are seeing um, they see uh, Louis guillotined and they start saying we should bring a guillotine here and so very gets very close to going a whole nother rotation. Monsieur Adam. I love that Adams only has one nice suit he wears this entire time. de science et des dames. Sir, jour et nuit, je m'active. That's not inaccurate. Franklin no. was a rogue. Um, he had a common law wife in the in the states, but um, it didn't really stop him from carrying on. <laughs> Not in the least. You don't speak French, Monsieur Adam. C'est uh, non, ne parle pas un mot de français. <laughs> So not speaking French is more than just not going to another court and knowing their language. French in this time period is really a language of diplomacy, mm -hmm. um, much like it English is. is today. Yes, mm -hmm. if you if you don't speak um, Dutch but you both speak French, you can get on quite well. So French is probably the second language many people would learn. So not speaking French is is pretty significant. Mm -hmm. Although, uh, you could say the film doesn't quite give Adams enough credit sure. here because he does learn how to speak French. And he becomes fairly fluent at it over time. Uh, and so initially, yeah, of course, he has some stumbling blocks. Uh, but he does learn to speak it because he realizes, like you said, it is the language of diplomacy. And if you want these people to give you a ton of money, yeah. it behooves you to speak their language as well. Um, so we never get a sense of that in, yeah. in the film. He's just uh, kind of depicted as this dawdling sort of plump guy, you know, walking around and bumping into people. And America needs more ships. General Washington is of the same opinion. Mr. Adams is, of course, aware that France is at war with England. I believe the person who they are conversing with here is the Comte de Vergennes, who is one of the chief 
a diplomatic personnel in King Louis's court, uh, and Adams was constantly badgering this guy. And here was the root of friction between Adams and Franklin. Uh, Franklin, ever the mediator, always looking for the middle road in many cases, uh, realized that he needed to tread very lightly in regard to his interactions with the French. And Adams was much more abrasive, and I paraphrase here, but he says, you know, the, the French are lifting us up out of the water just enough so our chin is above the water line, but they don't want to pull us fully out of the water uh, and spare us from drowning. Uh, and so I, I think this scene does a really good job of this sort of balance that is, is playing out. You learn nothing, Mr. Adams, if you continue to exasperate and antagonize these people, as I did in Philadelphia. It is interesting um, to think about the shift between the Declaration of Independence and a war and how that pressure manifests differently in the way you handle a stressful situation. You saw in the Declaration of Independence, everybody after they voted sort of paused and looked at one another and took a moment to recognize the solemnity of that occasion. But in France, if you're trying to get stuff and you know people are dying, I sort of understand where Adams is coming from and pushing because it's so important to him that he gets what he needs and he gets it quickly. Even if that's maybe not the diplomatic tool that would have been the best um, use. When you sail to Rhode Island, Admiral de Stan. And Abigail did indeed have dinner on this French naval vessel that uh, arrived in, in Boston. And there's sort of this uh, diplomatic tango of sorts that's, that's playing out here as the two sides are trying to measure up each other. Um, and of course, uh, it's also in the spring of 1778 that word of the Franco-American alliance becomes more pronounced. Uh, and so, this is kind of the first wave of what is to come. I have discovered, madame, that your husband has deceived us. I was told that his zeal for our alliance was born out of his eagerness to defeat the British. It is his desire to be reunited with you that drives him so. This is 1778, and a lot of this aid is being given because of a battle that's fought here in Pennsylvania in Germantown the previous year, 1777, um, that the British won that engagement, but the American forces were able to be tactical enough that it gave the French the um, reassurance they needed to actually be able to feel confident giving what they were able to give. From Philadelphia, sir. As we see Mr. Bancroft enter the, the picture here once more and you get a sense of all this paper shuffling going on, um, it's noteworthy to point out that the film leaves out a member of the diplomatic team here in the form of Arthur Lee. And Arthur Lee, as are all the Lees <laughs> interconnected here, very well-to-do physician from Virginia, um, who is one of the key architects of the Alliance of 1778, and he doesn't even get a reference here. This is most irregular, Mr. Bancroft. Those over the tab tub boards have seen a resurgence in recent years, but not as chess boards. <laughs> the Congress have named you the sole minister plenipotentiary to the court of King Louis, sir. Franklin definitely had a sense that this was coming because he was feeding the Continental mm -hmm. Congress letters saying, hey, Adams is messing it up. Uh, just uh, let me handle it. Uh, and so uh, Adams very much felt betrayed by all of this. Yes, Franklin did a very good job of orchestrating what he wanted. <laughs> the sad truth of the matter is, though, is that Adams, Lee, and Franklin, you know, they could really be considered the greatest diplomatic team that the country has ever assembled. And they 
they did not necessarily get along with one another. Um, and Lee and Franklin often bickered back and forth at one another as well. And Adams found himself in the middle because he found himself to be the tiebreaker uh, between the other two guys. And so they were always kind of vying for his support. And then, of course, he just ended up pissing off, you know, half of them. Well, uh, so, yeah. It's interesting to think that prior to um, two years previously, these people were from different nation states. So they had entirely different backgrounds and cultures. And now all of a sudden they're supposed to act mm -hmm. like a team. You should be in bed. So should you. That is not for you to say. Once again, I do think that one of the series' strong points is that human um, feeling and um, Gosh, when I've been having a hard day, I've gotten up in the middle of the night and been like, I'm just going to clean because that's what I can control right now is mm. what's around me. So I totally understand that. I can wait. I cannot. I cannot wait. One thing I love, just as a side note, about 18th century windows is that they're not all um, the same thickness and there are bubbles in them. So if you spend enough time in a space, you'll start to automatically go to look out of the part of the window that you know is the clearest. <laughs> um, muscle memory, you don't realize you develop until you have. You know, Paul is afraid his letters will be intercepted. What if they are? What do I care for British ridicule? Fun little bit of trivia about this house built on the set in Virginia. And one of our viewers pointed this out to us uh, that this structure was later repurposed as Ulysses Grant's headquarters in the movie Lincoln. And so the famous oh. scene, my favorite scene in the movie probably, where Lincoln and Grant are talking with each other, that is actually the Adams house that's from awesome. this series. Well, that's perfect because, I mean, a lot of those houses are this this time period. Just mm -hmm. dress them up in the 19th century mm -hmm. and you're good to go. Mm -hmm. I think they added a porch on it. <laughs> And yes, we will be taking a look at that movie as well. <laughs> if ever there was a natural alliance, uh, surely it is between the republics of the Netherlands and the United States. Uh. So I love the rug on the table because it is a legitimate table rugs were a thing. And it's not something you think about today, but look at it. Isn't it just look at those Dutch patterns? Oh, mwah. Uh, an initial loan of ten million dollars. Een bescheiden verzoek. Bescheiden man. So we had another big narrative jump here, because after Adams is recalled from France, he goes home. He goes back to Boston, and while he is back in Massachusetts, he pretty much solo authors the Massachusetts Constitution, which some people consider one of his great accomplishments uh, because it's the oldest constitution still in use in the world today. Um, and so, you know, Adams and Jefferson are talking about their respective state constitutions in the previous episode and how important it is and how they both want a hand in it. And then they don't even mention him writing it practically by himself just uh, a short time later. Jefferson does not get a hand in the Virginia Constitution because he's away uh, in Philadelphia and they write it without him. And despite the fact that he knows they've written it without him, he sends his own version just, just in case. Yeah, well, he's really good at throwing shade. So, yeah. yeah. I regret to say that American credit is not, forgive me, well established. <laughs> So one thing that's important to point out is the economic state of the colonies at this point, uh, former colonies, um, is that you've got massive inflation. Uh, so whereas um, previously most of the colonial economy was based on credit, so like we use a credit card today, but you'd have a ledger book and you'd write in how much you owed, um, or if you're lucky, you've got coin. But at the outset of the revolution, they start printing paper money and very quickly inflation goes through the roof. So um, you've got to go to other places like the Netherlands and France and try to get a bank or a government that's going to back you in something that's not colonial paper money, because colonial paper money is not going to pay any debts right now. We are in the business of lending money, but only to those capable of paying us back. 
And then to return the favor, we help bail them out 170 years later. <laughs> Better late than never. Yes. Let the artful old knave have his cursed French. <sighs> I am left with Holland. It was something like five or six months that he languished in Holland until like, anybody from the actual government would allow him to make his sales pitch. And so there's uh, it's a lot of hanging around. Hurry up and wait. Yeah. I'm come, come. Russia. Russia. Uh, here. A fun bit of trivia. Uh, the house that Adams lived in, after The Hague recognizes American sovereignty and agrees to help bankroll them uh, to an extent. Um, I believe it's supposed to be this home, which actually becomes the first U.S. Embassy on foreign soil. Oh. I'm sorry. I will do my duty. There's a nice bit of foreshadowing here because John Quincy says, I will do my duty. <laughs> and as our producer Andy astutely noted, he said, oh, he really does uh, throughout the course of his life. And so uh, this is very foundational to the very, very long line of public service that his son embarks on. Now, now. My name is Mr. Dana. Yeah. Yes, sir. Again, setting it in place with a canal. Really great momentary shot that puts you exactly where you need to be. I love the mud on the carriage. Every time you see a movie, carriages are mostly pristine because many of them are antiques in their own right, but I love that. But if you still say to me, Adams, that I should have the audacity to, uh, to present myself to the Dutch government before they are in any way prepared to receive me. So we get the impression here from these scenes and Adams being bled that he's presumably suffering from some sort of respiratory illness or something like that. He's pale, he's sweaty, he has fever, he's coughing. Um, but in actuality, uh, his, his own correspondence and what historians have written said that he was perhaps going through depression mm. at this time, mm -hmm. um, that he was on the verge of a nervous breakdown. Uh, and so it, it was perhaps nothing physically that was ailing him, but psychologically, uh, because he, he probably in no small part felt that he was a failure during much of this time. And, being the go get him sort of guy that he always was, that really belaggered him. Brought us the glorious news of the surrender of Lord Cornwallis and his army prisoners of war to the Allied army. I do love that in an age where technology can take a couple weeks to get news where you're going, or um, everybody has their own moment of discovery on these big events. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's very personal. Yeah, for Adams, it, I believe it was November of 1781, a full month after uh, the surrender at Yorktown that he actually finds out of this momentous military victory. The Adams. Something's wrong. It's the hate of that. It's the hell yeah. Hell yeah. Mm, cliffhanger ending. Will he survive? All right, so that brings us to the end of episode three. What are your thoughts on this one? Uh, I think that they did a really good job of taking us through the war without talking about every aspect of mm -hmm. the war. Um, and I do think they did an interesting job of showing the different diplomatic relationships that were necessary and Adam's role in those in order to win the American Revolution. That it wasn't just one on a battlefield, that it was one in the courts of other countries. Well put. So as we often do, we always like to do recommended reading. If you want to learn a little bit more about kind of the thinking and the ideology of Benjamin Franklin, uh, a really good one is the Americanization of Benjamin Franklin by Gordon Wood. And Gordon Wood is one of the top scholars of the American Revolution. We've referenced some of his works before. Uh, and so that's a really good one to get a sense of how and why he does these things against Adams as is depicted in the series. And of course, as we will always say at the end of every episode, 
you have to take a look at David McCullough's biography, a Pulitzer Prize winning book upon which this series is based. Uh, if you really want any understanding of John Adams, this is the one to go to. This one is uh, the starting point. Anything else you want to add? Well, I thought I might do, um, I mentioned last time there's a trifecta of movies that I would not look at for the 18th century, and I thought I might let people know what those were since there were some questions in the comments. Um, I had previously mentioned The Patriot. Um, it is uh, not great for both material culture and for storyline <laughs> as far as um, accuracy. Um, the second thing uh, I would uh, not look at for material culture is a uh, favorite, uh, Pirates of the Caribbean. I think um, in popular culture, it's a really popular movie. Um, and thirdly, uh, the movie 1776, another popular movie, but I really don't love the way that it downplays the role of women during the American Revolution um, to a single pleading song. Mm -hmm. um, the one biggest problem I have with pirates is the one line, um, you want pain, try wearing a corset. And I have multiple issues with that. <laughs> that being said, all three of these movies I have watched for personal fun and personal pleasure and have enjoyed mm -hmm. them from a cinematography standpoint. I just wouldn't look at them as historical references to the time. Um, Anything that gets you involved with history, though, is exciting to me. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Real History. We have more episodes of John Adams coming up soon, so stay tuned, and we'll see you then.